Without the ones like you, who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional grade industrial supplies. Count on real time product availability and fast delivery. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Hey there. Did you know Bakers always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Bakers app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Bakers today. Bakers, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Flaschenberg, and I'm your host of Yoga Birth Babies. And today we're going to talk about sex during pregnancy and after baby. So I gathered some of the students together in class for the prenatal class and the postnatal class. And I said, all right, what are your questions? I'm going to have a physical therapist who specializes in pelvic floor dysfunction. What are your questions about sex during pregnancy and after baby? So here's some of the things that came up. Can you talk about the concerns about sex during pregnancy and will it hurt the baby? That was something someone asked. Someone else wanted to know, has the vagina changed forever after birth? How do the hormones change sex after the postpartum hormones change sex? What can you do if sex hurts? So Dr. Sabrina Baxter is going to answer all all these questions and more. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Baxter. She is a doctor of physical therapy specializing in pelvic floor dysfunction for all genders, ages, and walks of life. She is very passionate about spreading education and awareness on bladder, bowel, and sexual health to help people prevent dysfunction, but also to help those with dysfunction acquire proper diagnosis from their doctor to receive appropriate individualized treatment. And I love that she talks about individualized treatment because while we're answering these questions in somewhat broad strokes, it is such an individualized experience what is going on with your body. So I hope this just gives you some insight into your body and some curiosity about your body because you deserve to live a really wonderful quality of life. And part of that is to have a healthy pelvic floor. Now, before we dive into this conversation, I just wanted to give you some updates about what's going on and the studio at Prenatal Yoga Center. So we're adding some more in-person classes back because we've had a demand for that. Now that said, we are still holding very much to our offering of online classes. Even though we're going to be having classes more in person, we're still going to have classes online seven days a week because we've noticed that we still have people in studio and we have people all over the world taking class. And also, it's really fascinating, we have people all over the world taking our teacher training. And while we're having our in-studio one in New York this fall, we actually found the online one is in greater demand. So we're going to keep that going. So if you're interested in a very deep dive into prenatal yoga, check out our teacher training. We have it in person twice a year, online twice a year. So you can check that out at prenatalyogacenter.com. And if you want to jump in for a yoga class, a prenatal or postnatal, check that out also on our website. So if you're in person, we'd love to see you at the studio. If you live elsewhere and you can't quite make it, we still can see you online. So check all that out on our website, prenatalyogacenter.com. Then the last thing I just want to remind you while you're on our website, if you want to keep up on all the things happening at our studio, as well as grab your free downloadable five simple solutions to the most common pregnancy pains, do so on our homepage. You can grab the free downloadable. You can sign up for our newsletter so we can stay in touch and you can hear about all the new podcasts, all the new events that we're having, and as well as our blog that we have going. All right, so that's enough of me. We're going to take a super quick break. When we come back, please enjoy my conversation about sex during pregnancy and after baby with Dr. Sabrina Baxter. With Lucky Land slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? 
Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hi, Sabrina. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. I am really excited to have you on my podcast and have this conversation. I have to tell you so many times after class, people are in little groups talking and I definitely hear them talking about sex during pregnancy and then what it's going to be like after baby. So I think many people are going to appreciate this. So thank you for coming on. Of course. So let's get started with just learning a little bit about you and how did you come to focus on pelvic floor physical therapy? So I kind of was thrown into it. I was taking, I was in my doctorate program and probably in some, like a little, the end of my second year was when we had a lecture come in talking about pelvic health, specifically about pregnancy postpartum. Actually, I hadn't heard anything about pelvic health prior to, and just her talking about the different changes during the body and things that can happen after pregnancy postpartum. I was like, oh, that is definitely something that I would love to empower women and on. I've always been the kind of friend that was very open when it came to sex, discharge, infections, like whatever it is. I was the friend that would talk openly about it and be like the least judgmental. <laughs> I love talking about this stuff. So when that lecture came in, I was like, I could definitely see myself in this field. And I requested a clinical rotation in pelvic health. And that was when actually I was exposed to all different ages, both men and women, um, you know, all different diagnoses and conditions, not just pregnancy, postpartum, actually pregnancy, postpartum were probably like less than a fourth of the patients that I saw, which was crazy, um, which we'll get into that later. Cause I think that it should actually be like 50%. But, um, I was like, wow, there is so much to pelvic floor dysfunction and so few people know about it and know about pelvic floor therapy as a profession. And just like thinking about things that I had gone through, like whether it was chronic infections or having pain with sex myself um, and just being like, oh, wow, these were all things that I should have known about or I could have known about or I could have kind of learned how to you know, find treatment for, it was just really cool. And that's when I started my social media and I was like, I have to tell the world about this. <laughs> I think it's so great because I think so many people live with pain and we're going to talk about that the pelvic floor and fear around pain and fear about the pelvic floor and fear about pregnancy and sex. And they just don't know who to talk about or feel that they can't. So okay. I love that you put it out there because I think the more we create this as a conversation, the less of a stigma, and then people can live a happier life life. I think if they're not scared of their bodies. Yeah, that's the goal. I mean, everyone deserves the best quality of life possible and it shouldn't be normalized that being pregnant and being postpartum should just come with pain. You know, I feel like that's so normalized, but just because something is common doesn't make it normal. Absolutely. I mean, that's a whole nother talk I have about incontinence just because you pee yourself <laughs> doesn't mean you should be. Right. So let's shift this to sex during pregnancy. So I actually sat down with some of my students and I told them I was having this this conversation. So I let them feed me some of the questions because I wanted to make sure that it wasn't just coming from my brain, but from what the community wanted to know. And one of my students was concerned about sex hurting the baby. And I said, I really don't think it does, but let me throw that out there. I said, you know, they're well protected. Your cervix is long. They're in the amniotic sac, but let's get an expert advice. So the, for the student that's saying, can sex hurt the baby? What do you have to say about that? Yeah, sex cannot hurt the baby. Listen, unless your medical provider or your physician or your gynecologist, you know, whoever you're working with, if they say, you know, for this medical reason, you should be avoiding having sex, I would not worry about sex hurting the baby. Honestly, worry about you, worry about your orgasm and get those endorphins in. <laughs> sex is great when you're pregnant. It's very, very necessary. I think it's great just to kind of relieve your body from all the tension and the stress and just even calm your mind. But yeah, the 
amniotic sac and the strong muscles of the uterus protect the baby. You know, there is a thick mucus plug that seals the cervix and helps guard against, you know, really anything, including infection. So, and during intercourse, the penis can't even really go by beyond the vagina. So it's definitely not going to reach or penetrate the baby. So sex is not dangerous while pregnant. Yes. All right. Let's check that one off. All right. Another question was, what are some reasons that someone might say that their vagina feels different when they're pregnant? So your vagina, I mean, also this depends on the trimester that you're in. Um, but the, the more pregnant you become, the more blood flow, like w- pregnant women have an increase of 30 to 50% of blood volume. So the more blood flow that you get to your pelvic organs, the more pressure you may feel, the more relaxed you may feel, you know, things may feel quote unquote looser. I'm not the biggest fan of that word, but just, you know, things may just feel a little bit more relaxed in that area, which is why, you know, someone may say, their vagina feels different. Um, also on top of that too, you may have just some increased pressure in that area because of where the baby is hanging out. You know, some people say that when you have a boy, the, the boys hang really, really low, whereas girls don't hang as low, but really wherever the baby is sitting, that can provide, like put some pressure on your pelvic organs and just feel a little funny in that area. Hmm. I actually should have pressed the student to be like, well, what do you mean by different? But I was just really, I was fascinated. I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. So, So another question that came up is, is there any time, and this may be beyond your scope, but I'm just going to throw it out there. Is there any time someone should abstain from sex when pregnant? So yeah, this is just super individualized and this would be up to their doctor's discretion. I mean, I would, as a pelvic floor physical therapist, I would tell someone to avoid sex if one, it was uncomfortable for them. You know, if they were having morning sickness or they were feeling fatigued or tired or low energy, I would, you know, and that really goes for anyone. I would never say, you know, push yourself to have sex if you're not in the mood to have sex or if you're not enjoying sex. Um, but medically speaking, you know, depending on if they had a certain diagnosis attached to them, or their doctor was monitoring them, like whether it was their blood sugars, their blood pressure, you know, whatever it may be, that would be more up to the medical doctor's discretion. And that would be out of my scope. But just from a pelvic floor therapist perspective, you know, if everything looks good on my end, I would just say, hey, you know, if you're not in the mood, then don't do it. (laughs) That's really it. I've had some people tell me that their care providers, if they had, um, placenta previa or a surclage that they were on pelvic rest. But again, that is very individualized. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Like there's no broad stroke. Exactly. Like preeclampsia, some cases of gestational diabetes, it really depends on what's happening physiologically. And that isn't something that I would monitor. I mean, I would be informed as part of the team, but I wouldn't like monitor that. All right. So here's a big one. What can do, what can someone do if sex hurts because we don't want it to hurt? Yeah. So this is my favorite topic. Okay. Go. (laughs) One important thing, and this has been like a little tweak that I've actually told a lot of my pregnant patients and postpartum patients is just focusing on your breath. And I know, you know, you being a yo- in the yogi space, breath is a huge thing. Deep, slow, diaphragmatic breaths really, really help in relaxing the pelvic floor muscles. Like when you take big diaphragmatic breaths, every inhale provides some pressure downwards onto the pelvic floor and helps those muscles relax. And on top of that too, it helps you tap into your parasympathetic nervous system, just all around putting you in this like nice, you know, quote unquote, rest and digest state. So really, really focusing on your breath if it's painful. Obviously, I know I feel like this goes without said, but lots of, you know, maybe it doesn't. Lots of foreplay, um, really warming yourself up. Even though you have increased blood volume, that doesn't mean you got to skip the foreplay. Definitely warm yourself up. Um, you know, and remember too that if you're not, if sex is super, super painful or you don't have to be having penis and vagina sex. There's lots of different ways to have sex and oral sex can be a good starting point. Um, using lubricant both internally and externally do not use, um, well, I guess it doesn't matter. I was going to say, don't use oil with condoms, but if you're pregnant, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but yeah, using lots of lubricant, make sure things are nice and wet. Um, and trying different positions. I usually, 
find or just from like feedback from my patients and just from feedback from my own experience with painful intercourse is the positions that I have more control over are the ones that, you know, I feel less pain, like where I can navigate the depth, I can navigate the speed. That's usually easier. Um, sometimes that can be missionary, depending on how big you are with pregnancy, that may be a little uncomfortable. Sideline can be comfortable. So yeah, really just finding positions that work for you. And I think this is really important to say, but I feel like a lot of women feel like they have to kind of like perform with sex or they have to like, you know, you don't have to be doing a million in one positions. Like you can find a position that feels really good for you and works for you and just be like, Hey buddy, like this is the one we're doing and we're sticking to this one. <laughs> so, you know, find what works for you and just stick to that. Um, because obviously what the most important is that you're also enjoying this. So what are some reasons that sex would hurt? I feel like the obvious is tightness in the pelvic floor, but what, what, how would someone deal with that? And what are other reasons? Is this for a pregnancy while, while you're pregnant? Ooh, let's actually break that up. Let's do prenatal and postnatal. So let's, thank you. Um, let's do why it would hurt prenatally and then why it might hurt postpartum. So, Prenatally, it could be, you know, like you said, there's an increased amount of pressure or just where the, how big the baby is growing. So that kind of pressure can be super uncomfortable. Um, and that can be one reason why sex is uncomfortable or painful um, during pregnancy. Um, other ones during pregnancy, I mean, if you're already were having pain with sex prior, and let's say you're in the first trimester, second trimester, and you know, you're really not getting that huge increase in blood volume or that huge, like relaxation of your pelvic floor muscles, you could still have some lingering pain with sex. Um, but I would say probably the biggest one that I see is just the pressure and the, the, I guess the, the new sensation that they're feeling. How often do you think, and then I'll ask about the postnatal, but how often do you think a pregnant person's pelvic floor is on the tighter side? Honestly, a lot more often than you'd think. Mm -hmm. Um, There, while yes, the increase in blood volume can help kind of relax the pelvic floor, this doesn't mean it is like a 180, you know? So that's actually one reason why people are at risk of tearing with pregnancies because they have a tight pelvic floor. So it's super important to get checked out like during pregnancy before even you, like even when you have an idea of getting pregnant, just to, you know, play on the safe side, get checked out by a pelvic floor therapist just to kind of see what your baseline is at because a lot of women have tight pelvic floors and don't even know. Yeah. I actually find that in class. Um, we're constantly, when we do the pelvic floor work in class, I go through a list of indicators and I have people, I can see it on their face like, Oh, Oh, I fit into that. And I'll remind them like, just because you think you should tone your pelvic floor, if you hit any of those indicators, don't do it, resist doing it. And I've had students say, but I feel like I should, I feel like that's what I'm supposed to do. And I feel like it's a big misconception of, Oh, I'm pregnant. I better engage, engage, engage. And actually, I think it's more common postpartum. A baby just came out, keep squeezing, squeezing, squeezing. And then they're making themselves tighter. Would you agree? Yeah. I mean, I, when I work with, uh, patients that are pregnant, let's say they're in the third trimester or postpartum, um, well, not immediately postpartum, but you know, and when they're getting back to their baseline, I'll usually do, I'll just do whatever's functional for the patient. So like, I'm never the practitioner that's going to say, Oh yeah, you need to be doing like a hundred Kegels a day. No, I usually like to do a combination of the two. Like if I have someone that has a tighter pelvic floor, but they could also be working on strengthening. I'm going to say, listen, your stretches, your pelvic floor stretches, your, you know, perineal massages, whatever, you know, diaphragmatic breathing, whatever we need to do to kind of down train your pelvic floor muscles, then follow it up with up training. So that's when we do, you know, adding Kegels in with diaphragmatic breathing or doing transitioning into lifting with Kegels or, you know, pelvic tilts with Kegels, just more functional strengthening. But Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I would never really tell someone, yeah, you need to be, too many doctors say that. They're just like, okay, postpartum, start Kegeling and don't stop. (laughs) That's basically, I remember from, I had two kids and I would do my six week checkup and they would (laughs) insert their fingers. Okay. Engage. Like, okay, just go do your Kegels now. And that was it. That was like, Right. And, and there you go. And, and fortunately I had some background of this. So I knew there was more to it, but a lot of people don't. And yeah. then they think they're following directions and they can be causing. So let's lead that into <laughs> what are some of the common reasons postpartum that sex may hurt? 
So there's going to be probably a lot more postpartum. Um, Postpartum can be, and this goes whether you have a vaginal delivery or a C-section delivery. So let's split this up now to C-section. So if you have a C-section delivery, that is a major, major abdominal surgery. And so many people just kind of brush that under the rug. But what kind of surgery have you seen that isn't followed? Like massive surgery like that isn't followed up with physical therapy, zero. Like you have surgery on your knee, which is probably the scar is the size of like maybe half my finger. You get physical therapy. People that have C-sections are very rarely followed up with uh, pelvic floor therapy, physical therapy. And like I said, you're literally cutting through like eight layers of tissue. So with C-section, when you're cutting through so much tissue, you can have scar tissue never forms as elastic as the original tissue. So you can have tissue restriction. You can have myofascial restriction. This restriction can also impinge on a nerve. So I've literally, not to scare anyone. I mean, this is, these are just things that can happen, but I worked with a patient who had, she actually had a tummy tuck and she had a C-section surgery and she started experiencing um, clitoral pain, which was a result of a nerve all the way up in her abdomen, which was affecting her pedendal nerve, which was affecting the, the blood supply and nerve supply to the clitoris. So it's just crazy how you know, our whole body is connected. And when we have these huge scars and this tissue restriction, it can affect the muscles and the nerves in that area. Was it pain all the time? Yeah. Oh, I feel for her. Well, it's not uncommon, but you know, it just goes to show that it's just such a big surgery and there's so much tissue involved that you really have to get in and mobilize the tissue and not a pelvic floor therapist doesn't necessarily need to do that. Cause I know not everyone has access to a pelvic floor therapist, but there's a lot of different ways you can mobilize scar tissue. There's a lot of ways on YouTube, on Google. Um, but it's really just the, the key thing behind the C-section is mobilizing that tissue. And on top of that too, just because you have a C-section doesn't mean your pelvic floor didn't take any of, you know, didn't, didn't do any work. Like you were still carrying a baby and it was putting a lot of pressure down there. So people can experience um, things like incontinence, pain with sex, et cetera, et cetera, just from being pregnant. So that was, if it hurts, um, for cesarean, that might happen. Yeah. What about for a vaginal birth, especially if it, if they had tearing or yeah. it was a traumatic birth? Yeah. So, um, with vaginal birth, if you experience any kind of tearing, that can def- same kind of thing with, with tearing, there needs to be a healing of that tissue and scar tissue is what's going to heal that tissue and put that, that tear together. So again, scar tissue is never as elastic as the original tissue. And that's when we would do some like kind of internal work to ha- kind of massage the tissue, perineal massage kind of work to just mobilize that tissue, mobilize that area to allow for easier penetration. But, um, and also just, you know, moving off from vaginal delivery from, for both C-section and vaginal delivery, just pregnancy in general, postpartum in general, you have this change in hormones, right? So when you have these hormonal changes and you have this decrease in hormones, you can start experiencing like vaginal dryness. You can experience decreased libido and all of that can contribute also to pain with sex. All right. I want to stick with that. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, let's talk about what we just talked about, the hormones and how they can change postpartum. Let's talk about what we can do when these things do come up, the vaginal dryness, the low libido. So we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we will answer those questions. We'll be right back. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. All right, so I, we're back, and I bet you just grabbed the attention of many listeners that are postpartum or are heading into that. So let's dive a little bit deeper. Postpartum hormones, there is a massive drop, especially if someone continues to breastfeed. So you mentioned vaginal dryness, low libido. What else could be an effect from postpartum hormonal change, and what can someone do to combat that? So postpartum, there are pretty low estrogen levels, which pretty much stay low until um, a woman starts cycling again. 
Um, and this can last throughout the duration of breastfeeding too, but this can contribute to hot flashes, you know, different kinds of pelvic floor dysfunction, vaginal dryness, low libido, hair loss. Those are all pretty common symptoms that can ha- that can happen, especially between one to five months postpartum. And on top of that too, with breastfeeding, you still have an ongoing production of the hormone relaxin. And this hormone is essentially really helpful to help soften the joints and the ligaments um, in order to make space for the growing baby. But postpartum, this can contribute to joint laxity and just overall cause some discomfort and possibly pelvic pain too. And also the hormone relaxing can also contribute to some aches and pains. Um, like I said, it helps loosen the ligaments to help you move closer to childbirth. But just the, the how relaxed you get during that can really cause some pressure on your pelvic organs and kind of contribute to that pelvic pressure, can, which also can contribute to some pain with sex. Mm. So I want to back up because I remember when I was asking my students, I asked the postpartum students as well, and a couple of them did have pretty traumatic births. And the idea of sex actually scared them because their pelvic floor just felt so foreign and disconnected. Yeah. What would you say to the person that had that traumatic birth and wants to kind of get back to sex? Um, but there's just a lot of fear around, around that again. Definitely be patient with yourself and be really kind to yourself because you did go through, you know, birth trauma is very, very real. And, whatever the birth trauma is, it's still your experience and no one should ever invalidate how you feel, how you felt giving birth and how you feel after giving birth. And I really, really recommend because postpartum depression is so real and so prevalent and so many times goes often undiagnosed. And and I really recommend working with a therapist, whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy or a talk therapist, just because getting that that support is so crucial. And it, it's really hard sometimes to talk to your husband or to talk to your partner, um, to talk to a family member because they don't really get it, you know? So it's really, or to even join support groups. Like it's really, really helpful to talk to someone who's been through something that you've been through. Number two is definitely, definitely work with a pelvic floor therapist. Pelvic floor therapists, especially ones that work with pregnancy and postpartum patients, have see this a lot. It's very, very common. So working with someone that has the knowledge and the tools to kind of tell you, all right, this is how we're going to get your body back to the way it was. This is, you know, let's, let's, let's make a check, a checkbox, right? Like let's make a list. What do you have to get through until what kind of things do you want to check off until you feel good in your skin and you feel good in the bedroom and you're mentally and emotionally and physically ready to have sex. So it can be really helpful to work with a a specialist like that pelvic core specialist, because we know what criteria your body needs to meet before you're going to have pain, pain pain-free sex, you know? So we really want to make sure that the stars align and you're feeling good mentally and emotionally, and then your body's feeling good physically. What are some of those criteria that, that you're thinking about for this person that had trauma before that, and then wants to have sex from a physical standpoint, you know, how are your, how are your pelvic bones feeling? Like, do you feel an alignment? Do you feel, do you have pubic symphysis dysfunction? Mm-hmm. Do you pelvic pain? Do you have hip pain, low back pain? Like where are you feeling joint and pain wise and bone wise? Um, two, you know, how are your pelvic floor muscles looking? I think that too many providers tell postpartum moms to go back to sex six, six weeks postpartum. And they're just like, what? Absolutely not. And that's okay. You know, just because that's the standard doesn't mean that's your standard. That's most, most of my moms don't want to go back to sex six weeks and that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with you if that's the case for you. Do you have any idea where did that standard come from? I'm just curious. I've been hearing this for 20 years and I'm like, and I've just accepted it. And then all of a sudden it popped in my head. I'm like, who set that standard? Is it because that's typically when the, the low key of the bleeding stops? Like, I'm just wondering where that six weeks came from. I mean, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but just from like, what I know is that tip, it takes, um, tissue six weeks to heal. I mean, obviously it depends on the severity of the tissue, but you know, most tissue, most cuts, most, you know, these things typically take six weeks to heal. So that's probably why they're like, Oh, around six weeks, like you're okay. good. So, but, um, that's very rarely the case. I mean, I have, I have had some moms that they're like, 
Yeah, I'm good. Like I'm, I'm ready. I went back to sex on it, but I would say probably like 85, 90% of my moms are like, there's no way my husband's touching me. (laughs) (laughs) All right. That makes a lot of sense. All right. So I start to think about, so not only that's my students, I sat down and start to think about the pelvic floor and sex and okay, I'm going out on a limb. So tell me if I'm wrong, but When someone orgasms and the pelvic floor muscles contract, is that helping them tone the pelvic floor? Like, is that like a little exercise jolt for the pelvic floor? Okay. So if you want to believe that, sure. (laughs) No, I don't. I I have no idea. That's why I'm asking. I I just like thinking about But I mean, that's why you want to have, if you want to just keep telling your, like your partner, like we have to have sex because it's increasing my pelvic floor strength, go for it. But, um, no, having, you know, experience yes you're contracting your pelvic floor you're absolutely right about that but um that one time isn't necessarily like working it out you know what i mean like when we do a workout like i'm not just doing one bicep curl and i'm like yeah i just worked out my bicep <laughs> so um no but yes it's contracting the pelvic floor so i mean it's a good way to know how to contract the pelvic floor so that with that, I'm just thinking like, is that something someone could think about in preparation for birth or kind of on the recovery or is it just, it's, it's enjoyable for hopefully most people and the muscles are just getting a, like a little release and stretch. It, it's, um, I mean, it doesn't really pre- prepare you for like <laughs> childbirth because with actually with childbirth, you don't want to activate your pelvic floor. You want to relax your pelvic floor. Right. I guess I was thinking like, um, there's a contract and release. So it's teaching people how to relax. Oh yeah. Well. Yeah. I mean, sure. Yeah. I guess, I mean, having an orgasm is great. Like pelvic floor muscle contraction is great. Like it's, uh, when I say don't do Kegels, it's not like don't ever do Kegels. Like your body will naturally do Kegels. Like sometimes people, you know, they finish peeing on the toilet and they just like do a little squeeze and they're like, Oh, I'm all done. Like, you know, people just will randomly do pelvic floor contractions during the day. Um, you know, Kegels obviously are overprescribed, but they're also, you know, I think they have a bad rep too, because they are obviously essential for a lot of reasons and they are very helpful. And just like a, your body's natural response, like most people, they naturally just Kegel when they have sex because it brings more just like emphasis to the orgasm and that's totally safe and great, but it's not necessarily a workout. All right. I was just trying to think of like how we can work if people enjoy sex, how you can be like, yeah, and I'm doing something extra for preparing for birth. I was just trying to think outside the box there. All right. All right. So another thing that came up in class because, oh my gosh, I love this one student. I won't say her name, but she was telling me how for about three or four weeks, after she had her baby, she would look at her vagina with a mirror. And I thought, that's great. You get to know your body. And she said she saw some great changes in there. And I said, I'm sure, I'm sure you did. So how does someone's vagina change after birth? And when does it, and I don't want to put necessarily get back to normal because as my midwife said, the, the landscape of your pelvis is forever changed. So knowing that the vagina is changed, when can we expect it to regain some semblance of what it used to look like and how has it changed after birth? Yeah. So this is a good question. And your, your body changes a lot with pregnancy and postpartum and, you know, with birth, you are, if you have a vaginal delivery, or even if you don't have a vaginal, vaginal delivery, there's a lot of pressure going down your pelvic floor. And with a vaginal delivery too, you are literally stretching to get a, sometimes even a 10 pound baby outside. So sometimes people can have a little bit more open of an opening. Like you can just kind of see more of an opening. Um, sometimes people can see a little bit of a protrusion of tissue, just not that there's like a prolapse, but there's just a little bit more laxity to the tissue. Um, sometimes there is a prolapse and just from the opening, I can see kind of a bladder prolapse or a rectal prolapse. And we work on that in therapy, but you know, I really like to, I, first of all, don't, I tell people not to look and get freaked out two to three weeks postpartum because again, you're still in the whole healing phase. Like things are going to change. They're not going to look the way they look three days at postpartum. You know what I mean? Like don't freak out. And I had a, I actually have a patient that I saw the other day and she's three weeks postpartum and she's like, oh my gosh, I can see a protrusion of tissue. I'm like, just wait. Like your body is still healing after giving birth. So let's just wait until I see you and yada, yada, yada. Um, but really from a pelvic floor therapist perspective and standpoint, I am going off of how you feel. Like I'm not, 
the last thing for me is like how you look there, like how you, you know, I want to make sure you feel good. Like you feel good in your body. You feel like your pelvic bones and muscles are supported. Um, you feel, you know, quote unquote tighter, like tighter in the sense that you just feel like everything is where it's supposed to be. You know, like it's the same kind of thing goes for how we feel about our bodies you know, in general, like look wise, tone wise, like how you feel says so much more than how you look. Right. And it's really what people should be chasing at is how do I feel, you know, uh, energetically today? How do I feel just like in general, how are my fatigue levels? How's my energy? How's my outlook on life? Like, you know, there's so many more things that are more important than how you look. And Mm -hmm. that for also postpartum and how your vagina looks. That's a great answer. So this question popped into my head because last weekend in postnatal teacher training, somebody asked why I don't tend to do a three-legged dog. So three down dog, your hands are down, your butt is up, your feet are down. And yeah. in a lot of vinyasa classes, people will lift the back leg to swing it forward. And I have been teaching this for years and I have noticed that if I do lift the back leg, a lot of people get what I call an airy vagina or queefing. Uh-huh. So is that due to the muscles have been stretched out? Is that due to the laxity because of relaxin? Why are my postpartum folks getting airy vaginas? Yeah, that's a good question. So actually a, some yoga poses that can be super helpful for being bloated or being constipated are down dog child's pose because you are kind of putting pressure on your abdomen and your pelvic floor and you're really opening up those pelvic floor muscles. So you're kind of stretching those muscles in that position anyways. Um, so if you already have a little bit of laxity from postpartum, um, let's say your, your vaginal tone isn't what it needs to be. And this really goes for if you have like chronic queefing, cause that's queefing, right? So right. Like, if you're always queefing, then, you know, definitely work with a pelvic floor therapist to work on that tone and see where your pelvic floor muscles are at. But if it's like a queef here and there, not a big deal. But yeah, to your point, like it's usually because there's some laxity and some air is getting trapped and it's just releasing. Yeah, that's why I, that's literally the answer. I told him like, I don't lift the back leg because of the air vagina queefing. Um, but that's a great point that if someone's, and I didn't think about that, if they're getting it all the time, they yeah. should look into that a little bit more. Well, I feel like you answered so many questions. Is there, and I know this is something you're really passionate about. Is there anything else about sex during pregnancy or after baby that I didn't ask about that you think is really important to share? I think we covered a lot during we sex did. pregnancy. I think that my biggest thing would be, you know, again, sex during pregnancy, you're not hurting the baby and have sex if you feel like you want to have sex, you know, and remember too, there's a lot of different ways that you can have sex. It doesn't have to be penetrative sex at all. Um, postpartum wise, definitely if you're oh, also d- just during pregnancy in general, if you're in pain, go see a pelvic floor therapist. You don't have to wait till your postpartum. You don't have to wait till six weeks postpartum. Like while right now, if you're pregnant and you're in pain and you're uncomfortable, go see a pelvic floor therapist. I can't even tell you how many pregnant women I've worked with. And they're like, I have been suffering. I've gotten corticosteroid shots. Like finally my doctor prescribed me pelvic floor therapy, or finally I found information online and just like, you know, just went with it and saw you. And two sessions later, they're not in pain anymore. Like it's just crazy how much just some deep tissue pressure can do to the body and some pelvic mobilizations and bone mobilizations can do to help the body feel less pain. And I bet that really changed the quality of their life. All right. We're going to take one final break. And when we come back, if you have one final tip or piece of advice you'd like to offer new or expectant parents, and it can be anything, it could be pelvic floor, it could be sex, it could be anything that pops into your mind that you want to leave people with. We'll be right back. Hey there! Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. So what would you like your parting words to be? Um, my parting words, I think this is going to be for my postpartum moms. I definitely, definitely 
want you to know what to expect. So I think that when moms are informed, they're more equipped to handle the normal physiologic and emotional shifts postpartum. I really want you to be selfish and focus as much on your self-care as you can. I really think that the medical field puts a lot of focus on the baby and not enough on the mom. So definitely make sure you are, you're able to Obviously, you're going to be tired. It's going to be a whirlwind of emotions, but do as much as you can for you. Sleep as much as you can. Eat plenty, plenty of food. You know, lean on your support system. Don't cut calories. Like, eat. Make sure you're eating because your body just literally ran a marathon and has no time to recover. So make sure you're eating and, you know, just practice patience and be really patient with yourself and, um, don't try to rush the postpartum process. Like you're, I love, I love, love the quote that says you just built a baby for a baby for nine months. Like you literally just built, carried a human for nine months. You do not expect your body to just bounce back in less than three months. Like how annoying is that, that quote bounce back? Oh, you totally nailed that. I hate that quote. Like bounce back. No one can bounce back. You're literally, do you, I also, uh, one doctor, I forgot her name, but she had a great analogy. She's like, people run a marathon and they get to recover for like three days. You give birth, you don't get to recover at all. So it's like these, how do you bounce back from that? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Ooh, it is a lot. So where can people find your work? So I am located in Fort Lauderdale. So I see clients in person in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I offer virtual consults. My website is drsabrinabaxter.com. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at dr.sabrinabaxter and TikTok at no such thing as TMI. Oh, perfect. I will make sure all of that is on our show notes. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. You answered the questions I gathered and I, and I feel that people hopefully will feel really empowered to enjoy sex and not be scared of it. So thank you for your time. You're so welcome. It was so much fun. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening. Hey there! Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower-than-low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's. Fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details.